there, my friend. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode here on the Fit Mother Project podcast. In just a moment, you're going to hear an amazing conversation where we have brought in an expert guest, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson, who is a PhD who works in the cognitive sciences, and she runs a company called Bright Line Eating that specifically helps people who feel like they have food addiction issues develop a sustainable weight loss plan. And I think this conversation is amazing because we truly have an expert who's zoning in on the psychology of food addiction that affects so many people. As she mentions in this episode, there's 2.1 billion people on the planet struggling to lose weight. And a certain percentage of those people have highly susceptible and addictive brains that have latched onto food and is causing tremendous problems. So Dr. Susan provides really cool perspective. I ask her some very good questions, and I think you're going to find a lot of great insights that she's gained from helping so many people lose weight. And before we hop into this episode, I'd love to read her bio because Dr. Susan's very impressive. So here it goes. Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester and an expert in the psychology of eating. She's the president of the Institute of Sustainable Weight Loss and the founder of the worldwide Brightline Eating Movement. Her first two books, including Bright Light and Eating, uh, became New York Times bestsellers and instant Hay House favorites. And Bright Light and Eating is on a mission to help 1 million people around the globe discover lasting food freedom and have their bright transformations by 2025. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode and you learn a lot about food addiction and you check out Bright Light and Eating. Let's hop into today's episode with Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. All right, Dr. Susan, welcome officially to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, this is going to be an amazing conversation because I really just want to pick your brain and really extract so much of the amazing information you have around weight loss for sure and how to make that sustainable. But on the on the back end of that, like the psychology behind our relationship to food, what's happening right now in the world with things like food addiction, and it just generally all the stuff that happens inside the ears that leads to lasting health. So thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks, Dr. Anthony. It's so great to be here. All right. So you are the founder of Brightline, uh, among many things, and, and effectively tell us what you do in your work a little bit before we kind of like dive in. Yeah, sure. So uh, Brightline Eating is a worldwide movement now. It's uh, people who have identified that they have a more addictive relationship with food, that when they indulge in certain treats, if you will, uh, scratching that itch doesn't make it go away. It makes it itchier. And they're mm. they're finding that they often lose control over how much they eat once they start. They often don't feel satisfied by what would seem to be a regular amount of food, but they still want to mm-hmm. eat more. They find themselves having powerful cravings, sometimes maybe binging. Not everybody experiences that, but some folks do. And generally speaking, spending more time than they wish they did, thinking about what they've eaten or not eaten, how, how many miles, how many calories, how many pounds, whether they're on their plan or off their their plan, whether they met their macros today or whatever, and it's feeling unmanageable. And so bright line eating simplifies all that and it heals the brain to take the load off of willpower and just create a really sustainable lifelong solution. So people who come to bright line eating on average have tried and failed at 16 or more uh, Mm. weight loss plans before bright line eating. And what they often find is that bright line eating finally solves the problem for them. Nice. And I want to unpack like probably the methodology of what you figured out, but I'm I'm really curious, how did you get interested and passionate about this? Was this something personally you struggled with? Like, I'm sure the answer is yes, but like, I'd love for you to like share a little bit, like for all of us, because we're really curious. Yeah. I come by this so honestly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, um, I wasn't an obese child, but I was pudgy. And, uh, by the age of 11, I weighed more than I weigh now. Um, and I started dieting, you know, at the age of 10 or 11. And Mm. what, what really, uh, took my turn, uh, my, my, my life path in a really different direction was I started doing drugs when I was 14 and I found Mm. that they would keep the weight off me. I also liked to party. I liked to socialize and the drugs graduated from, you know, pot, alcohol, and psychedelics up to crystal meth when I was 16. And that definitely got the weight off. Um, and I was addicted to speed hardcore for a couple of years, dropped out of high school, wow. a lot of psychosis, um, and then cocaine, crack cocaine, um, and prostitution and stuff. So by the age of 19, my resume was that I was a high school dropout and a crack addict and a prostitute. And I was literally living in a loop from the, the crack house out to prostitute and back into the crack house. And shortly after I was 20 years old, I got clean and sober. 
which is a miracle. So I haven't had a drink or a drug in 27 years. Wow. Uh, so super grateful for that. But my addiction hopscotched right over to food and I yeah. was obese in a blink. Um, and that's not really true. My my weight took a little while through my early 20s to climb all the way up to uh, obesity, but I was battling it all that time. I was going to 12 step mm -hmm. meetings for food. I was doing everything I could, you know, hypnosis and therapy and group therapy and diets and this and that and the other. And, um, yeah. And by the age of 26, I was clinically obese. Um, and at the age of 28, I found a way of eating that is, um, sort of the precursor to bright line eating. And it did help me lose all my excess weight. And at that point, I just need to sort of take a side road, which is that after I got clean and sober from drugs and alcohol, I did, uh, go back to school. Thank God for the community mm -hmm. college system. Uh, cause it gave me an on-ramp back into society and I did well there. And I transferred to UC Berkeley and got straight A's and spoke at the graduation and ended up nice. getting my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences. And I really wanted to study Dr. Anthony, you know, how, how could a brain like mine go so far off the rails? What is going yeah. on with that? So, uh, I got really into cognition and psychology. And I ended up being a psychology professor tenured. I taught psychology and, uh, brain and cognitive sciences at colleges and universities all over the world for 16 years. And um, and when I started Brightline Eating, really the intention initially was to write a book. I just wanted to write a book that would get the information out into the world. Because at that point, I'd been teaching a college course on the psychology of eating for many, mm -hmm. many years and the neuroscience of food addiction. And um, yeah, and then the Brightline Eating movement just sort of mushroomed from there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it obviously struck a chord with people who felt like the traditional diet advice, which is very prescriptive of, of like what to do, wasn't addressing the core of the underlying relationship to food. So can we get into that a little bit? I, I think like yeah. maybe like the neuroscience of food addiction, the psychology of food addiction. I think this is a conversation that we've we've danced around here on the podcast, but I think you, we can get to the heart of the matter. What's going on for people like in their psychology and in their neurochemical balance in their brains, if they're feeling like they're at the state where they're, they're out of control with their eating, you know, just everything you basically described, they, yeah. they can't manage their weight. What's going on? Yeah. Great. Three things. Yeah. The brain is broken, if you will. It's hijacked really is the right way to think of it. The brain's been hijacked by the foods that are in our current food environment and the patterns of eating also. Mm -hmm. And what that's doing is first of all, it's causing dopamine downregulation in the nucleus accumbens. So this mm -hmm. is addiction at its core. This is yeah. classic addiction. And I don't care if it's crystal meth or cocaine or uh, a donut. <laughs> it's going to downregulate dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which leaves you with a, a not enough dopamine at baseline when you're just kind of sitting around on a lazy Tuesday afternoon. And it creates mm -hmm. a feeling of itchiness, dis-ease, yeah. you know, like you got to go and it's uncomfortable. You got to go yeah. get something to, to, to deal with that. Right. So what happens is they're in a state every couple hours where they've got to top up, you know, and whether it's a muffin and a latte or it's a bag of chips from the vending machine, or it's, you know, or it's a, you know, some sort of fill in the blank bar from their latest diet, yeah. right. That's got sweeteners and all kinds of stuff in it. Right. Um, they've got to get something in their mouth to, uh, get a little bit more dopamine. So that's one thing. Another thing that's going on is leptin resistance. So yeah. leptin's this hormone that says that you're done eating, you're full, you're you've got enough food on board, and it create. You know, we I watch people with uh, with amusement and fascination at restaurants where they've eaten you know half of their plate and then they just push it away slightly and they're like, I'm good, I, you know. And I can see there's some sort of signaling system that's working in their brain that doesn't work in mine, um, hmm. and that's leptin resistance when your brain can't see that hormone anymore. It never gets the signal that it's time to stop eating. So that's caused by increased baseline insulin levels. It's caused by increased triglycerides. It's caused mm -hmm. by increased inflammation everywhere, hmm. but especially in the brain, in the hippocampus of the brain. Um, sorry, hypothalamus of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the little nuclei of the hypothalamus, uh, all these little nuclei sort of govern our eating behavior in really interesting ways. So um, the solution to that, of course, is to bring down 
uh, all of those things, triglycerides, inflammation, uh, and baseline insulin levels. Um, and when you stop eating processed foods, that happens very quickly in two or three mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, you can really change your blood levels very fast on that stuff. Um, you know, the sicker your cells are, the longer it will take. But, yeah. um, you know, the other thing that that's happening with us that Dr. Anthony, there's no quick like um, blood fix or brain fix for exactly is what I call the willpower gap, which is, you know, unfortunately, willpower, which we sort of think of as, as a, a force of character or, you know, oomph that like when we really want something, we're going to make it happen. Unfortunately, the part of the brain that carries that out for us uh, isn't a great soldier. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. not. It's it's called the anterior cingulate cortex, and it sits right behind the forehead, uh, mm -hmm. right behind the prefrontal cortex, and it's it's a bit of a um, a hub that's trying to govern a lot of things. It's trying to make sure that we resist our temptations. That's willpower, yeah. right? It's also trying to make sure that we regulate our emotions, don't blow up on somebody. It's trying to make sure we do a good job on task performance, like, you know, getting the spreadsheet right, going back and forth, checking the numbers. It's also helping us make decisions. So we're going yeah. through our email inbox, you know, reply all, reply now, reply later, file it in a folder, leave it alone, you know, just 15 minutes in email can blow this part of the brain out. So this part of the brain research shows is unusually gimpy. It just yeah. gets exhausted after about 15 minutes of use, which leaves us vulnerable on a Friday night after the, you know, the kids are clawing at our ankles and we've just sat through traffic to get home and we turn to our partner and we say, let's order a pizza, you know? And yeah. it's not that we are unclear that that's not on our plan, right? It's that the yeah. part of the brain that would help us execute over the long term isn't showing up for us. Now, there there is a solution to that and I build it into bright line eating, but this these are this is an idea, just sort of a smorgasbord of the um the issues that are going on and psych Psychologically, because you asked what's going on in the brain, you yeah. also said psychologically, what does this sound like? The um the kicker, kind of the knife in the stomach for someone who suffers from this, is what this sounds like in our brain psychologically, is it sounds to us like we've decided to order a pizza. It mm -hmm. sounds like we've changed our mind. Mm -hmm. And we haven't. What's happened is our brain has decided for us and it's demanding what it needs. And so an experiment that I often have people do is I say, you know, imagine that there, you know, go to a skyscraper and imagine that there's a duffel bag with $40 million in cash sitting at the top of this flight of stairs. And if you can hold your breath and run up to the top of the stairs in the skyscraper, you can have that duffel bag. Start running, buddy. And and the reality is they'll breathe before they get to the top of that flight mm -hmm. of stairs. Not because they don't want $40 million in cash bad enough, not because mm -hmm. there's anything wrong with their education, their knowledge, their motivation, their will, but because when the brain demands oxygen, it'll make them breathe. And mm -hmm. the way it'll sound in their brain when they decide to breathe is it'll decide like they gave up. It'll decide, yeah. it'll sound like they changed their mind. And this is where, unfortunately, over years of trying to eat differently and then failing, a lot of psychological issues come into play because what happens is you you feel like you've watched yourself let yourself down and yeah. you go looking for an explanation that would make that make sense. Right. Which means you start to conclude things like, I don't value myself enough. Yeah. I don't love myself enough. I'm not, I don't have strong enough character. I must not care about this problem enough. You start making up stories like that to sort of take account of the facts that are right before you, but you're failing to understand the, the physiology that's driving what's happening in the first place. Yeah. Amazing answer. I mean, and, and like, so it's in like short. all of that. No, really amazing answer. I mean, there's the neurochemical stuff, the, like the leptin resistance, the, you know, whatever it's a high sugar processed foods that are, that are constantly taxing our dopamine, you know, the busyness of our lives, which are making the anterior cingulate cortex, like tapped out right on top, all wrapped in the guilt and the shame and the, the, the thinking patterns that develop from many years of, of, of the brain of rationalizing all that's happened. Complex. Right. But it totally makes sense when you think about it. How do you begin to help people unwind this? Like, what are some of the initial steps that you go through in bright line eating to, to help people like peel back the layers of this? I imagine there's a methodology to this. Oh, yeah, there is. And, you know, what's interesting is I use the running upstairs um, example 
And so the thing about food and eating is it's operating with the brain, with the hypothalamus over a longer time course. In other words, the brain sort of has a, has a lot, has evolved to allow, you know, a few weeks or a couple months of wiggle room with our eating before alarm bells go off and it starts to demand what it now thinks it needs. Right. And this is because, you know, it, back in the day, food supply would ebb and flow. And it was a yeah. little uncertain. And not having enough food for a week or two or three wasn't necessarily the end of the world. Not having enough food for three months, that could start to signal the end of the world, right? If you weren't mm -hmm. prepared for it. So wh while running upstairs, the brain is going to freak out and demand the oxygen it needs on the time course of just seconds and minutes. When mm -hmm. it comes to eating behavior, we've actually got weeks and maybe a couple of months to play with. And so I say all that just to say, in bright line eating, we are very careful to set up a plan and a program and guide people through the first couple of months to automate behaviors so that when their willpower starts to crap out, yeah. You know, after a little bit and the the initial like rah, rah excitement isn't there anymore. They now have a whole new pattern of living that supports yeah. them. So the the willpower gap issue is really solved by automaticity. It's solved yes. by getting the basal ganglia to execute your eating behaviors. Um, and the basal ganglia is what, you know, helps so many of us brush our teeth flawlessly. I mean, I've mm -hmm. got a, a, a busy life, three kids, 33 employees, a busy life. And I still brush my teeth every morning and every night. You know, I brush my teeth. I don't have a sticky note on the mirror to remind yeah. me. You know, I don't need to care about doing it. I don't need to want to do it. I don't need to be in the mood to do it. It just happens. And it happens triggered by a certain time of day and yep. a certain sequence of, of, of behavior patterns that are happening around that time of day, a certain location, right? Mm -hmm. And then it just happens. And in the same way, I teach people, so now to give you some concrete things, I teach people to eat according to a certain structure yeah. that is optimally automatizable. Yep. So I am optimizing for automaticity, not for yep. nutrition, not sure. for, I am optimizing for healing the brain as fast as possible. And as that's happening, getting in the most automatic behaviors. And so that's how the Bright Line Eating food plan and sort of getting started process when someone joins and, and starts going through the getting started process, that's, that's what it's designed to do. And so within a couple months, they find themselves free, orienting toward food in ways that they never did before, just sort of succeeding at the breakfast, lunch, dinner framework. Yep. And it's just happening all of a sudden by rote. Yep. Yep. And then, and then it's like, you get, then you're on the, the confidence competence loop. Like you're seeing success, your neurochemistry yeah. is changing. And now your psychology is starting to change on the back end of this, just by simply being on a structure that's more automatic. And I think our fit mothers and, and fit fathers that are listening to this are going to be smiling because I, I, through my own experience, I stumbled upon the exact same thing. And the beginning of our fit mother and fit father meal plan is all about one, creating a meal timing schedule setup that works ideally for each individual person. Cause it's like a structural hook every day that you can be into and also limiting decision fatigue in the beginning of the day, like standardized go-to meals for like early in the day. So that it becomes more automatic and still enjoyable. And then you start to build that positive momentum. So it makes a ton of sense. I mean, yeah. we're, the, both of these things are, they're working. Okay. Totally. Really great. Now, what, what what kind of tools do you have for people as they're going throughout this journey? They have more structure. The brain is becoming, you know, more automatic with these nutrition habits. They're seeing more success, but inevitably there's slip ups. You know, let's say it, it is the party that they go to or the weekend blowout and there's psychology associated with all of that. How, how do you help people navigate these kinds of like ups and downs that never really happen? Because weight loss journeys are not linear and healing journeys are not linear. Please speak to that. Yeah. You know, my third book, Resume, is all about that. It's R-E-Z-O-O-M. Nice. In other words, get back on track fast. <laughs> Resume mm -hmm. fast. R-E-Z-O-O-M. And I talk a lot about expecting life to get lifey and the sort of yeah. sine wave, the ebb and flow yeah. 
And and turning that sort of crash and burn cycle where um, in the past we used to start off so strong and then something would happen, then we'd crash down into the danger and destruction zone where we're just binging or eating or not caring or, you know, and then for for me, I know it used to take a long time to get up the gumption to really start again. And I would want to start so strong and so hard that it would take a while of misery for me to be Mm -hmm. ready to start again. And so this uh, steep up of success and steep crash down into the pits of despair, we can um, keep the same ups and downs, but just smooth it all out and kind of raise it all up so that when you're sliding down, what I teach people to do is, um, first of all, note that your support and your habits will be slipping before the food slips. Hmm. And if you're always scanning, I teach people to sort of scan with a nightly checklist and and sort of uh, ways of tracking their journey so mm-hmm. that they're hip to it if they're vulnerable, right? They know yeah. they're like, okay, I've been falling off on my morning meditation. I haven't been in touch with anyone in the community lately. And they know they're scanning. And so they know um, I'm, I'm ripe for a slip, basically, yeah. right? Um, and with just that forewarning, sometimes people can pull themselves up into resume mode and be like, okay, I'm going to a party tonight, but I really should pack my own dinner. You know, I got no business trusting a buffet at a party at seven o'clock at night. Right. Um, now once someone has already slipped, um, we, uh, you know, we've got a formula for getting back on track. And, and the main thing is we really build a lot of love and support and connection into our community. So there's Mm -hmm. just, there's a whole, because, you know, in Bright Line Eating, I tend to serve people who are the highest on the food addiction susceptibility scale. So people whose brains are, uh, they're just going to struggle more on average, Mm -hmm. right? Now that doesn't mean that they're never going to be successful. We have the highest success rate published of any weight loss program on the history of planet earth, right? Um, and that's with dealing with the with the population that struggles the most, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have to build in extra love and support into every slip, you know. So, for example, yeah. here's just a little a little example of that. We have something in Bright Line Eating called the Gideon Games. If, if people want to participate, you know, not everyone does, but um, it's it's a 90 day cycle, and you join a team of 10. And you're just just tracking aggregate bright days. You know, did you stick to your food plan today or not? And you get a one if you did. And you put a heart on the spreadsheet if you didn't. You don't put a zero, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just little things like that, right? Uh, we all need extra love when we slip. And so we normalize bringing it into the community and sharing um, when we've had a slip and just getting love and support to get back on track. Because I think the isolation and the shame that come after yeah. a slip often you know, the shame spiral just, just tears us down. You know, I would love you to, to, to ask you this directly based on you obviously provide people with nutrition guidance and, and, and probably some movement guidance and obviously all the, the psychological guidance that's around here. What, what, what percentage of the success of your methodology do you, would you attribute to the fact that people are in a like-minded supportive community? If you had to put a number to it, 25%, 10%, 50%, I'm just curious. Maybe, maybe maybe a weird question, but I would love you to throw something out. Um, fifty. Or answer it in a different way. Fifty five zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really, really high. Really, really how, high. How I'd amazing is that? I think people listen to that, right? Like being a part of a community. You as an expert who's seen so much success with your clients, five zero percent of it, maybe even half the game, is because you're a part of a supportive like-minded community that provides just a nice nest for you to like continue to work this thing in a loving environment. Wow. Yeah. And here's, here's a reason for that, Dr. Anthony, that I think a lot of people wouldn't think of, but you know, human beings are herd animals, you know, Mm -hmm. just put yourself back 5,000 years, you know, into the climate of wherever it is that you live and try to imagine living in that climate alone right? Your odds of survival are so minuscule. Without a clan, without a tribe, without a community, you are dead. And so our brains and our psychologies are so attuned to needing to 
stay in sync with the social norms around us so that we don't get ostracized from our community, right? There's these great Mm -hmm. uh, candid camera videos from the 50s or 60s where they put people in elevators, right? And then everyone else was in on it and they turned to the back, facing the back of the elevator, right? And the the guy in the hat is like, what's going on? But then you see him (laughs) kind of slowly turn and face the back <laughs> of the elevator, right? Because yeah. it's even for five seconds. That's how right. uncomfortable it is to, to right. not do what everyone around you is doing. And so when we start to eat really differently than the rest of this, you know, crazy food addicted, you know, weird food environment world that we live in eats, eating and drinking, right? All the time until 11 o'clock at night, the average person is putting their last piece of food in their mouth at 11 o'clock at night before they collapse in bed, right? When we start to do something differently and people say, that's extreme, you know, (laughs) you're going to eat like that forever. Are you still eating that rabbit food or whatever, right? Uh, It what happens is something deep inside starts to feel like we w- mm. we're threatened because we are we don't belong anymore and so the connections within bright line eating become a strong enough headwind uh or tailwind actually a wind yeah. in our back to push yeah. us through that headwind right it's like because if we don't have that community uh our resolve erodes, erodes, erodes with the comments from other people and the family members who do it differently. And the, you know, like my spouse doesn't do this, you know, a lot of my, you know, none of my best friends from, you know, back in the day do this. And so, uh, my people in bright line eating do. And if I were to leave, I would be jeopardizing a significant portion of my social support because it comes from bright line eating, you know? Yeah. Great answer. And in my experience, I think it's even it's most important to have that support in the initial phases of your of your takeoff. Like as you're starting to build this momentum and and like, let's just say it is a weight loss journey. You're like most fragile in those early times. And as you start to get more of this positive momentum, you become more robust. So that community nurturing you in those early times. So important and obviously continuing to sustain it. I'd love to pivot a little bit and and talk about how the psychology changes through different stages of, of one's weight loss journey, let's say someone has a hundred pounds to lose, and then they do lose that hundred pounds. Maybe they do it in a year. I want to zoom in on this particular group of people who have achieved a measurable weight loss goal that they set out to do and how things change in their psychology past that. When they get into this idea of sustaining maintenance mode, they have some habits like What's that like? And can you speak to speak to that type of person who has achieved success, but now they're effectively on the road of continuation for yes. not just the next year, but for the next hopefully 30, 40 years plus? Right. This is what bright line eating is best at. We we don't think of ourselves as a weight loss company. We think of ourselves as a weight loss maintenance company. We help mm. people get down to their, what we call their bright body, right? Which is different for everybody. Uh, You can call it goal weight or whatever, but it's really, uh, we call it the bright body and have their bright transformation and sustain it uh, long-term. And uh, it's interesting you asked this question because right now I am uh, rolling out a course on maintenance, an entire Mm -hmm. course that's focused just on uh, the psychology of maintenance. And so one of the things that will happen is, well, I, I mean, so there's, there's, there's so much to it. I'm, you know, it's mm-hmm. an eight week course. There's a lot to it. Um, when someone transitions to maintenance, there is a huge risk that they will encounter something that a colleague of mine named Everett Considine uh, has so aptly named finish line anxiety. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they will hover, you know, maybe 10 pounds above uh, where they think their goal weight is because it feels more comfortable to not finish so that they can hold on to the food and weight problem because it's been such a big part of their life and their identity for so long, right? So what I teach people to do is understand that uh, tendency And to recognize that nature abhors a vacuum. And if you don't fill the time and space and energy that you used to put toward your latest diet, right, or, you know, just eating into oblivion or whatever the issue was, right, uh, sometimes people are used to spending up to 80 or 90 percent of their vital life force, their time, their energy, thinking about their food and their weight, right, other than just the basic 
uh, jobs of daily living, that's really their focus. And so it can be very scary to solve the problem once and for all. And mm-hmm. so we talk about finding purpose and we talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm famous for saying that I do believe with 2.1 billion people overweight or obese on this planet right now, that the person who's destined to solve cold fusion is starting their fourth diet this year. And they're not even yeah. thinking about the equations to solve cold fusion, right? It's mm-hmm. horrific. The amount of time and energy we are wasting on our food and our weight. So, um, so that's one thing is that someone who's going to succeed has got to be mindful of putting enough meaningful, flourishing based stuff into the space yeah. and the time that they used to spend, uh, thinking about their food and their weight. That's a very big one. Yeah. Nature abhors a vacuum. I think that was really the quote that really understands that it must be filled with, with new purpose for sure. I want to pivot a little bit because I think what you said was 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 amazing that there is someone out there who will solve one of our greatest problems right now who may be struggling with this this foundational problem of maintaining health and weight. It seems right now that we have a world that's creating all the conditions for that to be a problem or there wouldn't be 2.1 billion people in this particular environment. You're raising three kids as you mentioned. Let's talk about what it's like to raise kids with a healthy relationship to food in today's day and age. I mean, it's imagine it's, it's fairly, very complex. I have a very little one, right? My kids, you know, my one's taking breast milk in right now. So we have pretty good control over what's happening with, on that front. Um, <laughs> You're but, crushing but, it so far. You're doing you're great. You're crushing it. We're yeah, 100% <laughs> like best diet yet. But, but, but speak, speak to you as a mom raising kids, knowing what you know, also knowing the pressures out in the world. What's it like to help kids develop a bright line eating kind of mentality, I I guess? Maybe that's not the right word. You know what I'm trying to say. Let's talk about kids and and raising kids in this environment and nutrition. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, Dr. Anthony. It's a nightmare. It's really, really hard. And, you know, uh, unless I lived in an ashram in Oregon where we were all just eating brown rice and kale and tofu, which I don't, you know, I live in a suburb of a, you know, reasonably sized city in the United States and my kids go to birthday parties and their middle, you know, I have, my twins are, uh, 14 and the youngest is 10. And, um, you know, they have vending machines in their school yeah. and their school at, in the lunch program sells, you know, cookies, um, ice cream, uh, chips of every variety, you know, as lunch. Right. And, um, yeah, it's really, really hard. So, what I've done that has worked, um, in as much as it has worked. And, you know, I think the jury's out, right? I don't, I, I wouldn't put my kids out as the healthiest eaters in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I do not foist bright line eating on them. Bright line eating, um, which is a no sugar, no flour, um, plan for people who really think they have an addictive relationship with food. Yeah. You know, my kids, it, that's not appropriate for them. And yeah. kids often live on crackers and air. I'm not about to take cracker, crackers or pasta away from my kids. My kids eat dessert sometimes. We don't, we don't serve dessert after dinner in our house, but yeah. if we go out and my kids want some dessert or whatever, fine. Um, unless it's a school night or whatever, but what, you know, all I'm saying is my kids eat far more mainstream than I do. Mm-hmm. And what I've done that's worked is I've followed something called the division of responsibility, which is attributed to Ellen Satter. And what she says is, look, as a parent, it's your job to maintain meal structure. So mm-hmm. you serve meals at meal time, and kids need a snack in between sometimes. And, and you serve foods that you feel co- good about serving. And you eat them with them. And you once the food is on the table... You leave to the kid whether and how much to eat of what's provided. So if you've served a whole dinner and there's chicken and there's broccoli and there's rice and there's butter and there's salad mm-hmm. for, and salad dressing and butter for the bread and and your kid just wants to eat white rice drowned in butter and four bowls of it, you know, you don't say peep, you know, the next day, like my kids, because I have um, refrained from praising or scolding any of their choices around the foods that I provide. They eat what they want to eat from what I've provided. You know, all three of my kids like broccoli. All three of my kids like Brussels sprouts. Um, They each have their fruits that they prefer. Um, And sometimes, you know, I'm eating a huge salad and they're eating ramen. You know, Mm -hmm. now that they're old enough, they'll just be like, no, I just feel like making ramen and my heart sinks, you know, but it's Mm -hmm. like, 
their brains aren't dumb. Their brains know, oh yeah, this food provides far more food reward than that food. Mm -hmm. Now my kids know a lot more about the reality of nutrition and the reality. I had a great session with them in the grocery store where um, I just taught them about grams of added sugars in cereal and cookies. I was like, let, you know, you want to eat this cereal? Let's go to the cookie aisle and let's see how many grams of sugar are in a Pepperidge farm cookie serving with 160 calories. Oh, look, 14 grams of sugar. Let's go look at this box of cereal you want, right? How many calories? (laughs) What's the ratio of calories to grams of added sugar, right? And they're like, whoa, this is like eating cookies. I'm like, yep. So, you know, I'm able to teach them a little something, something, but I got to say, you know, until we solve our food environment, we are not going to be raising a generation of kids that's fundamentally any better off. You know what I mean? This is not a knowledge issue. This is, this is a food environment issue. You're right. It is. And it is not the food environment also just driven by corporate profit of what we know people will buy and eat. It's kind of like a very complex thing. I mean, we know the foods that are going to be bought that are in the high profit margin are are those in packaged processed foods in the middle of the shelves um, based on a lot of things that are easy to grow and uh, are high reward. So it doesn't seem like it's going away. (laughs) There's a couple of things, right? So there's the there's the 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 farm bill right the subsidization mm-hmm. of it's not that those foods are easy to grow it's that they're subsidized Th- those foods right. actually uh run at a loss that that hmm. gmo corn that gmo wheat that gmo soy that doesn't go into tofu it goes into partially hydrogenated soybean oil which is the fat that goes into all these snack foods right those commodity crops uh get grown at a loss and it's the US government's mm. dollars that make those far those huge mega farms successful. So okay. the minute we pull away those subsidies, the minute our food supply changes. So that's the first thing. The that's second hopeful. Th- yeah. That's that's yeah. hopeful. That seems like that okay, that's that's hopeful, right? Okay. Yeah. Second thing. Second thing is um you know in in England at the beginning of 2023, so the beginning of next year, they're, they are implementing a law that will take effect where food companies cannot advertise any hours that kids might be awake and watching, which they're deeming to be, I believe, 5.30 in the morning till 9 p.m., including on the internet. No sugar cereal commercials. McDonald's can advertise, but only if they show people eating salads or something. Not if they show wow. people eating anything that's too high and sugar, fat, salts, any junk food, yeah. processed food. So, um, you know, and research shows that where taxes are put in on sodas, people drink less soda. It For really sure. does work. Right. So there are some things we can be doing. And then the other thing is, I know the individual person tends to feel so powerless in this equation, but they're just making the foods that we're buying. Right. Mm-hmm. The reality is we're buying a lot more organic food and we're as a as a society and we're buying a lot more um, vegan choices or whole food yeah. plant based choices. And those foods are the fastest growing, um, you know, f- sector of the food economy right now. And it's because people are buying them. So don't ever forget that your dollar really matters. You spend a lot of money on food every month and they know it. And if you mm-hmm. start changing what you eat, it will change the food supply. And it's already happening. Right. It's already happening. The food supply has changed tremendously for the positive in the last 20 years. Yeah. It's a vote. Every time you're buying something, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a vote effectively for what we want to see in the future, but based on demand, right? That's amazing. And okay, but, I pick, real quick, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, but although the food supply in some ways is changing, uh, what is also happening is our kids, including our teenagers are eating worse. So yeah. two thirds of the calories they are putting in their mouth right now come from ultra processed foods. They're not even foods. They just come from uh, industrialized ingredients poured into bags in factories. So that's two thirds of the food that they're eating now. So they are not showing any of the benefits of all the uh, organic and you know plant based foods that we're buying. Yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, obviously, these foods that they're eating are are going to be by their nature inflammatory, and that infl- I mean, yet young, robust bodies have a better ability to deal with that than as when we get older. But do you think that is going to impact? I mean, uh, you know, development of like IQ and other things like this in these teenagers as they're going through. I mean, are we going to see the impacts of a generation eating absolutely crap food for the formative years when the brain's really developing? We know d- taking drugs too early has a profound impact on on the brain. You know, smoking weed when you're 14 is different than when you're maybe 30 or whatnot. Yeah, I think we're already seeing it, right? The mental health crisis that we're seeing in adolescence right now. Research right. shows that if kids, if teenagers eat vegetables today, they're happy tomorrow. It kicks in that fast. 
And so I think we're already seeing the mental health effects of the crappy ways that our adolescents are eating. And then, of course, you know, diabetes by the age of 30 or 40, leg amputations and blindness setting in, you know, to one third to half of the population is what we're facing by the age of 35. You know, it's it's going to be bad. You just wait. It's going to be really bad. For sure. These, chi- these all- chickens are going to come home to roost. Right. Totally. They must. Right. Every cause has the effect that we're going to reap that for sure. And, you know, a couple of things. One, childhood obesity in particular seems really bad, especially when you're when you're obese at a very, very young age and your body has actually produced more fat cells and we're actually doing fat cell hyperplasia as opposed to just like hypertrophy. And so really young kids who are obese probably have a greater propensity to be obese later in life. And that's, that really stinks, right? It, it, it hurts me that that's going to be the case, that there's that ripple of that effect. Um, what I actually want to ask though is the effect of like sleep and circadian rhythm on this whole picture. Cause that's, I think another big thing, both for people who struggle with food addiction as adults, but also for young kids, maybe in their teens, who are spending a ton of time late at night on phones. Can you talk a little about like circadian biology and how that plays into this entire uh, symphony that you've kind of laid out on what's going on? Yeah, it has a huge effect, of course. So when we don't get enough sleep, um, our brains start to demand more food and more calorie dense food, like more crappy food, right? Um, and so we think we're hungry, but we're, it's just that we didn't get enough sleep. Um, and as you said, light into the brain late at night is one of the worst things. And it flattens out the circadian rhythm, which means you're not tired at night, but you're tired during the day, right? You should have nice big peaks and valleys in your circadian Mm -hmm. rhythm where melatonin goes way up at night and then it's almost non-existent during the day that allows you to be tired at night, but awake during the day. So, um, it's a, it has a huge effect and, you know, we, we take away on school nights, we take away all phones at 9 p.m and we lock them up and kids have no access to their phones. Um, and maybe that's not late enough, but, or early enough mm-hmm. rather, but, um, you know, it, it, it helps tremendously and yeah, it's really important. Nice. All right. Well, well, to wrap this up, I'd love to, love to turn the stage over to you one more time to maybe share a couple more words of encouragement or philosophy or anything that's like, you've maybe wanted me to ask you that we didn't get a chance to touch on. And then I love at the end of that for you to share how people who are really interested in this can learn more about Brightline Eating, where they can find your websites. And of course, we're going to put all of your contact information, all the stuff in the show notes for this episode as well. So oh, stage back to you to share something awesome. And then we'll, we'll then also talk about where people can find Brightline. Sure. Yeah. I, I just want to say that um, food addiction is real. It is a real thing. You can look on a brain scan and see the dopamine blowout from someone who's been eating all these high, uh, high processed foods. And the thing is that not every brain is equally susceptible. Some people, a third of people just aren't susceptible to addiction at all, believe it or not. Those folks who say, oh, everyone's addicted to something. Not true. One third of people are not addicted to anything and never will be. A third of people are moderately susceptible to food addiction. And a third of people are very highly susceptible to a food addiction. So you might already know uh, where you're at on this scale. But uh, if you're trying to be healthy, which listening to this podcast, I'm certain you are, one of the most empowering things you can do is to learn where on that susceptibility scale your brain falls because the types of solutions that will work for someone who's higher on the susceptibility scale are just frankly more potent, right? Yeah. And just like someone who used to smoke a lot and now has lung cancer and needs to quit smoking, we don't ever recommend a moderation program for them. They should not be smoking any cigarettes, none. Yeah. And for some of us, that's what cookies are like, right? That we will do better in life if we don't eat cookies at all. And so just know if you have a sense that that might be you, you're not alone. Uh, You know, a good 20 to 35 percent of the population is in that camp. And so just you're not alone. Find out what kind of brain you have and then you can really do something about it. Nice. Awesome. I mean, powerful answer. And I think everyone can kind of. I'm moderate and I actually have, we have some addiction stuff that runs in the family. I'm just kind of geolocating myself on this spectrum right now as you're talking about it. And, and, you know, I can see being actually like on the moderate part of that spectrum, why I developed the type of health program that I did. It was actually like a health program for like a moderate third, but I can also see, and I'm very grateful for why there are programs like Brightline Eating out there for the people who fall into the third of being very, very uh, susceptible to addiction. So on that note, if someone's like, dang, I think that might be <laughs> me. 
<laughs> like, where can they find you? Where can they learn more? Where would you like to direct them? Yeah, absolutely. Go to brightlineeating.com. And it's it's spelled the regular way, B-R-I-G-H-T. L-I-N-E, brightlineeating.com. And if you want to take a quiz that's just five questions, it's super short to know exactly what kind of brain you have, go to foodaddictionquiz.com. Foodaddictionquiz.com. It's a scale from one to 10. I'm a 10, God bless me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm what we call a 10 plus plus. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's the one time it's not good in life to be called a 10. So, right. um, yeah. Anyway, that those are the places that I would direct you. And you might enjoy my books too. Um, Bright Line Eating and The Cookbook and resume are my three. And books. those are on Amazon. Oh yeah. Yeah. New York okay. times bestsellers. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Susan yeah. Pierce Thompson that they can find that on Amazon as well. Thank you for coming on, sharing your wisdom, very enlightening. And I really appreciate your perspective on this. And uh, thank you so much. 